Please welcome Vanessa Kasavian to the stage. Well, thank you for giving um, us the chance to speak here at the university. Um, I think that all of us that um, were here for the conference have a connection to New York, and I just want to say how excited we are to have um, the Technion be part of the, um, the new development that's going to um, teaming up with uh, Cornell University. So um, we are looking forward to having Technion represented in New York as well. Um, Els mentioned that uh, Snohetta is a combined landscape architectural firm. Uh, our office is actually not named after any particular person. It's named after the mountain which you, oh, it's not connected actually to the screen, <laughs> which is there. Um, we said that we, um, we wouldn't name ourselves, we wouldn't be as egotistical to name ourselves after the highest mountain in Norway. However, the name is Goldkopigen, and we were all a little bit concerned that that didn't sound as good as Snohetta. So there is no Mr. or Mrs. Snohetta, um, but um, a mountain. And every year, the two offices get together, and we hike the mountain. This year, we were lucky enough to be able to take almost the full hundred of us up to the Reindeer Pavilion. The first project that we've had open, actually, on the mountain of Snohetta. So that was kind of a, a wonderful feat for us, um, a very small, minimal box um, with the glass facade for the reindeer on Snohetta to be able to, to live freely. Our offices, both in Oslo and New York, are on the waterfront edge. Uh, we say that we live on the fringe and we like to kind of be on the fringe of architecture and design. Our offices are both landscape architecture and architecture. And that is something that, that once the office was started that we feel very strongly about. I understand that there's a very strong landscape department here at Technion as well. And the discussion about how to integrate the two disciplines. So that's something that um, we've worked very hard at. We still have a more predominance of architects and landscape architects. But the landscape architects that work at our office actually have dual degrees. So they come back uh, from, most of them are from the University of Pennsylvania with a landscape and architecture degree. Um, our offices are very collaborative and very casual. We have kind of a work and food relationship. When you walk into both offices, you see the kitchen. Uh, we actually have a, a beer tap in the um, New York office and we all eat lunch together and all the meetings happen in one space. So you walk in and you're greeted by a large open space. Um, where the meetings happen and everything is very uh, interdisciplinary and collaborative. Typically when we start off projects, we work on a charrette basis where uh, we'll get the whole office together. The New York office has 40 people and um, we'll kick off a project, we'll introduce the project, we'll split into groups of about five, spend a couple hours like really working together and um, you know, working uh, messy models, we don't sit at a computer, um, just kind of have a lot of discussion, and then we will present it at the end. A lot of the times the models come out looking like this, um, and that generally will turn into um, to architecture or a landscape urban, urban design plan. Um, we also take charrettes out of the office. We went upstate New York a couple years ago and um, work on fictitious projects. Something where, you know, not only do we work on the projects, but we talk about what is the office culture? How can we all work together? What do we expect from the, the office and what do we expect from each other? Um, a lot of times we, we do then translate that into a more sort of formal system. We work a lot with laser cutters, 3D printers, but it's really important to kind of start initially with that sketch phase, with the um, really kind of a, a dialogue that happens before um, turning into the computers. The office started in 1989 by winning a competition, the Alexandria Library in Egypt. And this was actually seven architects that got together, <coughs> American, uh, Norwegian, and Austrian. And those seven people got together, they worked out of the Los Angeles and submitted the proposal. There were hundreds of proposals that were submitted. 
and they won. It was an anonymous competition. And then seven of these hippies showed up in their late 20s, and I think that the Egyptian government was terrified that, you know, how are we going to get these people to be able to, to realize this job? But uh, those seven persevered, and 12 years later were able to open the Alexandria Library. Um, we think a lot about the horizon, about the actual space itself. Um, we, we like to say that, that we think vertically and act horizontally. So the, um, the skyline, materiality, um, this project was actually one of the most um, early sustainable projects that um, even before sustainability started to be talked about. The project had a lot of natural light that came into the space um, where they didn't need a lot of electricity most of the time, local materials uh, for thermal um, comfort, water to um, also cool. And um, so it was a pretty big urban development project. There was a lot of discussion about being able to to bridge and connect to the waterfront and th at this time. Um, none of that was actually realized. There was no tunnels, there was no bridging, but I think that by um, bringing the water in too close to the building that it actually brought um, the harbor into the project and it feels like the water is part of the building. Um, and lucky enough, we've had two very significant projects. Um, this project was also a competition, an anonymous competition in Norway, and it is the Oslo Opera House. Um, this one was much closer to our office, however. This was right around the corner. You could even see it from our office. Um, so this is the, the entry for the competition itself, and you can see that it was realized almost exactly as the competition drawings were submitted. Um, this project, really also thought about the, the landscape and public space and democracy of a building and really being able to kind of give over um, the, the building to the landscape, the, the people, um, and, and connecting to the water again, something that in the area around the fjord was, um, had been a challenge. And this kind of really kicked off a lot of development um, in Oslo as well. It was the first um, opera building Specific, specifically um, meant for the opera in Norway. So it was pretty significant. However, a lot of people didn't go to the opera. So, so this project was able to bring people from all different demographics to, to actually experience and be part of the, the building itself and the waterfront. Um, a few years ago, they had uh, an exhibition of Carmen and it had sold out inside. So they offered it for free on the exterior of the building and thousands of people came, even though people were wearing coats and it was very cold, but um, it was really allowing um, people to kind of experience the building and use it for what it had been intended for. Um, not just for a group of people, but for a single person, you know, something that we also think about when we design our projects. The plan of the building is very simple. Um, it's a 1300 seat opera house. It's got two other, um, functional uh, theaters, um, performance theaters, and then the um, a kind of corridor that runs the link that splits the performance areas from the administrative areas. Very clear, simple diagram. The um, theater and performing areas itself are what actually sat out over the water, and the administrative areas was, was actually on land. The interior of the spaces, um, you know, being able to experience the building from the exterior but also experiencing from the interior, looking to the exterior, is something that we're um, very partial to. That, you know, clean lines, very um, simple, keeping things off of the ceiling, um, light to the exterior. Uh, one of the things that we, we really focus on is being able to uh, have artists collaborate with us. Um, this project was actually school children, um, the surrounds of the theater, the wood. The performance area in the, the lobby needed to be as acoustically sound as the rest of the building. And so the children randomly placed these kind of wood slats together, and then they were panelized and put up on the wall. We also work with um, artists for uh, some things as simple as like bathroom surrounds. 
the Al Alafar Eliasson did, the bathroom surrounds, they're sort of illuminated um, panel systems that change color as you, you walk through the day. Uh, we have performances in the lobby. Really, the whole building can take performances. Um, simple materials, we, looked, we worked a lot with wood. From the building from the exterior is um, kind of very simple and um, marble. However, the interior, we wanted to feel very warm. This is the main opera house. Um, we worked with shipbuilders and um, Arab acoustics and our consultants a lot to be able to come up with a very strong curvature system um, for the, the theater itself. Uh, Pay White, who is another artist, did the, um, the theater curtain. This curtain may look like it's kind of crumpled tin, but it is actually a completely flat surface and not one ounce of uh, metal fabric at all or thread into this thing at all. Really beautiful. Um, the, even, even the seat uh, coverings were, were created specifically for this project. Not one of the seat cushions is um, the same as another. And even the chandelier that, that floats in the theater itself was created with an artist and with acoustics in mind. So it acted as uh, an acoustic baffle as well as the light for the inside of the, the theater. Um, not only are the front of house spaces important to us, but you also have to remember the people that use the building. 600 people a day are in this building using it constantly. So not only do we allow, we really focus on having light filled spaces for the, um, the scene shop, but people that work there are able to see out and be part of, um, part of the city as well. Um, being able to experience the water is, is something that was, like I said, very um, different for, for Oslo along this area. So we really tried to bring people cl up close to the water. And 60,000 tons of pollutants were removed from the fjord when this project was developed. And for the first time in years, wildlife, birds came back to the, um, to the opera. And at night, this is kind of a fun picture because uh, you can see at the very top of the, um, the theater itself, the shadows that are cast on the wall. Those are actually some of our architects dancing and playing up on the, and there you see them in the shadows. So um, performances happening all over, all over the building at all times of night. And that was the opening day of the opera. Um, the project that brought us to New York was actually winning um, a competition, the World Trade Center um, Visitor Center, the only building that's actually on the World Trade Center site itself. It's an entry pavilion and um, has the family room in it. It has an auditorium space in it. Um, so something that is, um, we felt very um, precious. When we won the competition, I think it took a little while to actually decide that we were gonna go after it. That, um, that at that point, the office was in Oslo and people felt that it wasn't necessarily the most appropriate thing for a Norwegian firm to be building at the site. However, the partner in our New York office is um, American. So we thought that um, after being asked a few times that we would go for it. Um, so this is a project that is currently under construction. You can see the little plan of the building there. When we started the project, it was about 200,000 square feet. Um, it had a drawing center in it, a lot of cultural program. Um, the building for the competition was beautiful. However, um, we were not able to get it through once it went to the public. Everybody said, wow, this is a beautiful building. We really like it. However, it's definitely, um, we don't want cultural project on this site. It's not appropriate. Um, so the project was almost dead. We spent a lot of time trying to come up with a program that was appropriate that we felt for the site. We fought a long, long time for it. Um, and now the project is, is small, a little jewel in a way, but it's um, about 40,000 square feet. So quite a bit smaller than the original, but I think a pretty powerful space. Um, it really kind of, you know, slopes and focuses your eye up to the surrounding buildings as well. Sort of a transition from the, the pools. Um, it's a complicated site. Uh, Michael Arad won the competition he, um, for the pools themselves. Came up with a really beautiful design of sort of the footprints of the towers, um, waterfalls and the names surrounding it. 
Peter, um, Peter Walker did the landscape around it, and we did the project um, that you see up there in the kind of middle, uh, as well as the, the museum underneath was done by Davis Brody Bond. So about four or five of these projects were, were combined together. And um, any time like one little shuffle of a, a column or anything because of the overlap between all of the projects, then everything kind of had to stop and, and be kind of re re readjusted. We, there were about five or six different architects that worked on the project, on these different projects, different um, contractors, different consultants. So you can imagine how complicated it is. You can see the museum below. Um, this is what the project will look like, and it's pretty close to getting to that point at this time. And this is the construction process as, of it going on. It was actually, um, we had the ceremony for opening day and, um, and the 10 year anniversary. So you can see the pools there, um, our building. It's, the pools are often referred to as reflecting absence. And we like to say that our project is reflecting presence. So we used a lot of reflective materials. It reflects the landscape, it reflects the city around it, it reflects the people. And this is the, um, the evening shot when on the anniversary you can see the towers projected in the background and you can see two of the um, existing the columns that, that were, were found at the collapse of the tower. So those are, are two of the columns that, um, that had held up the uh, World Trade Center. Um, when, we, when we came to New York, we thought, wow, we're just gonna probably have this for a few years. Well, 10 years later, it, the project is still not open. Um, in that time, to be able to keep an office open, we had to take on other projects. So this project was actually the first project that we took on and was the first built in the United States. So this is a collaborative art school in Bowling Green, Ohio, 400 seat theater, um, connects the architecture and theater departments uh, as well as music. So a similar kind of dividing corridor that the opera house, um, small theater uh, landscape that integrates um, into the, the back of the, the project that slopes up people are able to hang out and um, the students are, are able to hang out together. The entry space for it, the lobby space, um, it's really important for us to have interaction um, among the students and, and people that can, can um, just sort of by chance run into each other, hang out. We have lectures on the, um, the stairs as well and the connecting corridor, so a little bit rougher. Um, this was the Hunt Library that just opened. So this is our second project that's opened in the United States. Um, much, much bigger than the, um, the Bowling Green project. This project is um, 250,000 square feet. Um, and we really worked a lot with sun shading on this. So we worked a lot with the fins and the facade systems and trying to keep it as transparent as possible. So you can see it at night there, um, well lit up. One of the things that's interesting about this project is that there is a system called um, ARS, an automatic retrieval system that you see here. And we were over budget on the project, too much square footage. So we worked with the client to come up with a way to be able to give over public space to the project, keep the project on budget. So uh, this is an automatic retrieval system. All of the books in the library are stored here, or at least 90% of them. It takes about five minutes to retrieve a book when you want it. However, it gives a lot more public space over to, to the people that use the project. Um, people are hanging out here all, all the time. When we were there for the opening, people were using the building heavily. Every surface almost you could ride on. You can see the automatic retrieval system there to your left and the stair. So trying to keep the, um, the building as simplistic as possible, but really giving it over to the people. Um, another great thing that the office does is this is us going there for construction when the construction process was going on. So a lot of times young architects don't get to see the, um, the, the working of a building, how it's constructed. We took the entire office there and were able to walk the site, have lunch. And one interesting thing about the project is this is the first project that we did with BIM, with Revit. So uh, our contractor worked with it. We, did, we were the design architect on it. We had a local architect. And so we worked with um, this project, uh, the program for the first time. Um, it was a challenge for the office to do. However, I definitely think it's been the smoothest of any of the projects that we've had in the office. Um, so 
This they actually have the model on site and we were able to see it. Any changes that happen, um, any of RFIs, any of that kind of stuff that comes through can automatically be updated right on site. And what's great is all of that comes from sketches like this. Um, so like I said, we, we really value the first conceptual sketches and ideas that come out of a project. And um, often surprisingly, they do turn into the real building. Um, one of the bigger projects in our office right now that we're working on is the San Francisco Museum of Mart Modern Art Edition. I don't know if anybody is familiar with it, but this is a Mario Boda building that was built, um, I think about 15 years ago in an area that was fairly run down, but a very iconic building. Um, strong building, a hard building to add on to. Uh, it's about 250,000 square feet. It um, has functioned very well, I think. Uh, and, but the Fisher family, a, a family in, in San Francisco has donated a large collection of art to the museum. And as well, the museum is gonna expand. So we are adding an entire, uh, basically new building. We're doubling the size of their existing building right now. Um, one thing that we did when we um, started looking at the project was looking at the area around it. There's a grid system that's set up in San Francisco, um, sort of nine quadrants that they use. Then there's also a, um, an alley system that's sort of prevalent in San Francisco, something that we felt very we thought was very intriguing about the city itself. So you can see that um, you're probably wondering where you would possibly be able to connect through but we are using um, two of the, the orange buildings are gonna be demolished. It's a firehouse and a little, um, little shop that's gonna be taken down. And uh, a portion, a low portion of the Mario Boda building is actually gonna be removed. We were actually talking about this last night. Um, we met with Mario Boda himself to be able to kind of like discuss that we are gonna take off part of your building. You know, do you, is that, how do you feel about that? And um, I, I'm not sure that he was thrilled, but he uh, accepted the proposal. So that's gonna be where the site sits. We span between Howard and um, Minna. And um, what we did was we connected the two street sides. Um, the um, Natoma, there's an alleyway that's actually gonna be pedestrianized pretty soon. And so we are creating the main entry to the new addition by, from Minna and from Howard Street. Um, there is a driveway that goes underneath and an easement, which is a challenge for us. So the, the lobby of the building needed to be raised up. We couldn't enter off of the street unless we wanted to enter off of um, Howard. But because of the entry and the size of the building for both the Mario Boda building and ours, we thought having one central lobby was the best way to go. So we are working with the Boda stair and lifting our lobby up so that the ticketing, everything happens in one central location. Um, this is our building framing behind the Boda building. It's seven floors. The top two are the um, uh, administrative areas. And it's a simple kind of thought. Like we raised up the building, really allowing the sort of public to be able to flow through um, and carving it back to allow for natural lighting. So you can see that um, it's a very thin space between the, the small building next to it but allows light through, There's that, that had previously been an alleyway. And by connection, this is a section through the building um, with the Mario Boda uh, lobby on the left. So now we're gonna be able to create, we're revising the stair through there and being able to take people directly up and you can have a visual connection up to the lobby. So you'll be able to see the lobby from both the new entry and from the Boda entry. And that's how we're creating the lobby on the low, um, upper level. Um, another thing that, like I mentioned, you know, we're very interested in being able to offer things to people that um, don't normally get to participate in the opera or art. Um, the first thing that you see when you approach the building is art. It's, um, they're gonna have a Richard Serra piece right in the um, entryway. And um, you enter here to the side and you go up to the lobby but once you kind of enter the lobby, everything that you've passed is free. You can actually be, um, hang out in that lobby space. There are stairs that go down to it. Um, and so all of this area is for free. Um, there are lectures there, also people meet and get oriented there. Um, and whatever's gonna be in that space is going to be um, open to the public. Uh, the, boat, uh, the Richard Serapis is supposed to be there for about five years. And this is the lobby itself. So even once you get up to it, we've created a green wall off to the, um, the right on the upper level 
for terrace. So um, there's always a connection. You see that right from the entry from the Boda building as well as from the um, entry on Howard. Um, this is a performance space, uh, kind of white box gallery that then can transition into this. So those were both the same spaces, just reconfigured um, for whatever type of use it needs. And then the, um, what we call the city gallery, something that will always be oriented. This, the circulation will always be on, on the right. It always has connections to the light and natural light. And, um, and then the galleries are off to the left. And there's a model of the, the project itself. Um, there is a, a sculpture terrace that is on a parking lot uh, directly behind it that is currently part of SF MoMA. And so we're, we're keeping that. And actually, the bridge that was connected through that one gallery is, um, is remaining. And you're going to be able to go out to the sculpture terrace. So it's still part of the project. And this is a, um, a view of it from, from the um, entry from the Howard Street. When we start a project, we, like I said, we really think about the, the environment and, and the place that it is. And this was something that we found a, a very evocative image. And it is the, um, the area in San Francisco, which is pretty much known for fog. Fog and, and water, surrounded by water. So we took that, and we used that to try and create the facade system. And we did different scales of it and how the shadow would play on it. And then we build mock-ups, something that, you know, different scales of it to see how, um, how it, will, it will relate or how it's actually the scale of it is, is translating. Um, we're working with Chrysler in San Francisco. It's a, um, a, a GFRC panel. And what's interesting about this is it um, was able to minimize the structure of the project um, for economy. And so you can see how thin they are. They turn the corners. But um, it gives us a sort of um, a system that can be hung and reduces the, the um, structural load. So it was able to bring the cost down on the project. And this is what the facade system will look like. Um, from that project, we did pretty well getting through the authorities. And, um, and, and one of the board members highly recommended us to actually work on this next project that we're, we're just starting, working through a concept phase um, for the, the Warriors Arena. Um, what we typically like to do, we have duplicated projects, but um, you know, we went from a library to an opera house, and we've never done a stadium before, but this is going to be our first stadium. It's a challenging site. It's right on a pier on the water on the San Francisco Bay. You can see the Bay Bridge behind. Um, in order to finance it, the city owns it, and it's a pier that is um, dilapidated, and they can't rebuild it. They don't have the money to, so right now it's just a parking lot. Um, pretty much an eyesore for the city. So the Warriors have agreed to lease it and to rehabilitate the entire pier. Um, I think that the project itself uh, with the arena is about $120 million. And so to be able to, to finance that, they're also working with a project across the street from the Embarcadero, which is a mixed-use project. It's a, a residential and um, hotel and retail um, piece that will help um, fund it. So they both need to be open at the same time. The arena project, in order to minimize the height on the Embarcadero, we pushed the arena as close to the water as possible. Uh, we worked a lot with our landscape group. It's a 6.8, a 7 acre site, um, predominantly um, plaza landscape. They are, uh, the entire storm water system is, um, is going to be captured on, on the, the plantings in the different areas around. Uh, you can see the retail buildings to the left there at the Embarcadero. And, but the, the sketch itself, the sort of inspiration for it was the Bay Bridge. So to be able to um, enter to the lobby, you know, being able to kind of come from the Embarcadero, you come from behind, you turn the corner, you see this Bay Bridge, and you kind of ascend stairs up to it. Uh, all the parking is underneath the plaza area. We've reduced, the current stadium is at the, um, in, in Oakland right now, and we're reducing the parking by 90% by moving this, the stadium into the city. And this is the circulation you can see on the outside of the, the project. And this is the entry plaza for it. So the kind of as you enter to the right, you kind of have a beach kind of plaza area, uh, retail to the left, 
and then you ascend the stairs to go in and to get into the um, arena itself, you kind of take this ramp up that gives you a full view of the bay. Um, and different, different environments, depending on the um, water conditions, the wind conditions, environmental conditions. Um, and then the night view uh, that obviously it will be seen from the water. So um, something that, that it was critical for it. And views as you kind of walk around of, of the water itself, being able to look into the, the arena. Um, one of the big urban design projects that we're working on in the office is for Times Square. Um, probably a lot of you have heard of it. What's interesting about the project is you can see the plan up here. Um, it's the Broadway and 7th Avenue Street for, um, they call it the bow tie area in Times Square. What they've done is a lot of um, in public spaces in New York, they've had pilot programs where they close down an area or a plaza or a street and have either kind of put barriers up, painted the sidewalks, painted the streets, and kind of given it back over to the city to see how it's used. Um, this was, I think, a surprise to everybody, but closing Broadway actually was really highly um, re received within, within the city itself. And you can see how um, kind of chaotic it is. I think most New Yorkers hate to go down to Times Square. Um, but when you do go down, you see that there's not a lot of amenities. There's people sitting on fire hydrants, on the floor, um, children eating their lunch on a curb, uh, you know, leaning against uh, newspapers. Um, and so by looking at that and, and examining the um, actual um, site itself, we realized that the streets weren't flat, that, that actually there, there was elevation to it. So we talked a lot about how we could um, use those elevations and, um, and how to perceive, how people can see our, their environment and be oriented, orientated. Sight lines were critical. We started out with doing um, different sort of platforms in the area, um, places that people could sort of step away from all the traffic and, and pedestrian cir circulation and be able to hang out. Um, it is a pre predominantly tourist situation, so um, I think that, you know, when you're standing there looking at, at all the signs that uh, you don't want to be in, in the p traffic path. We created different areas, um, those, those platforms, uh, turned into long benches, 50-foot long benches. Um, those benches then take over uh, a lot of the infrastructure. So all of those things that you saw people like leaning on, not um, too many, you know, light posts, any of the kind of infrastructure that's like overkill in, in Times Square, we tried to simplify and complement and, and really kind of add to um, uh, the, the infrastructure to combine it and creating balance down there. So the... Um, Times Square at night. And there's all your signage and all the chaos. And did we want to create more chaos? No. So we wanted to simplify the ground plane, create something that complemented the surroundings, thinking about the history of the, of the Times Square itself. It's gone from being kind of um, porn shops and cabaret to uh, film noir, um, different lights, different, different kind of um, atmospheres, bringing a little bit of that back. One of the things that we used was, even though we're creating a very simple ground plane, we're using these little puck systems so that when they get wet or when the lights come on, they kind of reflect and sparkle. This was a mock-up that we did in Times Square itself. So creating different grid systems that, that follow the city grid itself, um, sometimes you'll have the, the little pucks that glow in specific areas, so that's kind of right around the benches and the areas that you sit in. And then showing kind of a rendering of the intent for it, crossing it over the streets, really creating a very sort of monolithic plane. And the rendering of what we um, hope it's going to look like when it's built. It's actually under construction right now. They're starting with the infrastructure under the city. We built a bench, uh, the bench mock-up as well because everybody had a hard time comprehending what a 50-foot long bench by five foot wide would be. Um, and the clients are there standing on it. It will actually be out of granite, but um, this was for scale only. Times Square now, and Times Square what we hope it will be. Um, 
So all the projects that I've shown are very big projects. Um, this is actually a project in, um, in Guatemala City, and we were approached to do a project there, and we actually went out and we visited the site, and um, this is the type of stuff that we saw. Same type of thing, people were sitting on the corners, the sidewalks in disarray, and um, we said, you know, it's, it's got such a, such a vibrant culture, and the people are so wonderful, and maybe, the, maybe a building isn't the right thing for us. So we, we proposed doing something, um, a, a piece of furniture that, that could be used for all over the city. So this is a bench prototype that we came up with. And where you see the, um, the colored pieces, that is where we proposed um, having a, um, an artist be able to contribute to, to the benches themselves. So thinking about the vibrancy of color and being able to use mosaics and things like that. So each artist was able to have three benches and this was the first prototype of it being done. And um, these are the workers in the shop having it made, and this is it on the site. And I think that 33 of them have been done right now. So um, I think it's uh, uh, fairly easy to say that we've, we've, we've contributed a lot, I think, to the, um, the, at least the, the public life in Guatemala City. Um, another small project that we've just won, um, which is going to be constructed in Montreal, we just won an international garden competition that our landscape group did, and um, we call it kind of a, a nest. And um, the landscape architects in our office are going out to build it, and it should be up for a couple years in Montreal. Uh, and then the last project that I'll, I'll mention is a... Um, a, a dollhouse that we did. So a variety of different scales, different things. Um, this was a few of us got together and, and started, um, we were approached by a hospital in El Paso. And um, it was for a donation. So this was something that we were, it was a pro bono project we weren't paid for. Um, and the first sketch that came out was a little girl wearing the dollhouse. Um, so in reality, we all loved this, but didn't think that that was going to um, actually fly. So um, we did a bunch of models. You can see up at the top these kind of like different model pieces that open and close together on hinges to kind of give a little bit of a surprise as you opened it. And then this was the final dollhouse that was, um, was built. So it actually closes and opens and, and you have all the kitchen and all the furniture in it. We went through the tiles, the little dog bowl. I mean, we really outfitted this whole thing. And we even had a graphic designer work on its own little uh, uh, branding. The, we called it the Bloomberry House in a little book. And then this was all of us standing around, opening it up and looking at it. And um, this was a great project. It was auctioned off. And it was um, one of the surgeons at the um, hospital bought the project for his daughter. And what was really great about it was that we had, there was an exhibition in New York. And um, a group asked us to build another one for the exhibition, which we, of course, spent twice as much money on and time on and really went over the top on it. Um, and we all loved it because it was in the office for a long time, but it just got auctioned at SFMOMA for $50,000. So thank you very much. <laughs>